welcome everybody. It's your boy, the Versace Stoner. We're here with a very special episode of VSW. Tonight, we have the one and only, the mind eraser himself, Mike Grasa. Welcome. Hey, how's it going? Thank you for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure. You know, you're somebody I've been watching for well, probably since I got into indie wrestling. And, um, you know, you you always delight and dazzle out there. Um, very unique character, and it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I try to be different. I'm trying to – it's a, very important to me to be unique. So I'm glad that I caught your eye. You did. You know, different is important. Um because, you know, let's face it, there's a lot of the same anywhere you go. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be wrestling, movies, music. There's a lot of the same. And it's just sometimes just little pivots and little key changes that make someone different that make you do stick out. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but you are definitely one of those um, guys, you know. Um, you know, just as recently, I, you know, I caught you at um, their Blitz Creek show last Friday the 13th. Great yep. matchup. You know, you were in there with Perry Von Vicious and Sammy Diaz, and then they, they added Alec Price into the mix at the end of that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that that's a good four-way scramble right there. That's a good matchup. Mm -hmm. It was it was intense. It was a lot of fun. But now let me ask you, if you think about the beginning, in the very beginning of your career, would you ever, like, thought yourself to be up on that platform? Uh, when I first started, uh, I mean – I didn't really think too far into the future when I first started, honestly. I was um, very focused in getting ready to be able to perform. Uh, I had just, I was still in high school, so I was focusing on graduating, obviously, and wondering what I was going to do with college. Uh, I had just left football, so I was. <laughs> Kind of all over, but very busy guy. So I was. Yeah, I mean that is. I mean high school is wild. I mean I remember. I mean I do. We actually still remember the days. I'm not that old yet, but you know you got a lot going on. There is, you know, if you're in any extracurricular sport or anything, not you know happening. Plus end of the year stuff. Plus like you said, college. You know, whether you want to go or not want to go, or whatever. You know, you always look into it. You try to apply to something. Try to see what you're going to do with the future. Um, but you were also trying to break into pro wrestling at the same time, or at least starting to train. Yeah, I started training when I was 17. It was, well, my birthday's in June, so I was 17, about to be 18 when I started training. Um, yeah, it was in March of 2011. So, yeah, I had, I had a little bit going on. I was worried about graduating. Football season had pretty much ended in, like, the winter before that. So I was figuring out if I wanted to play college ball or if I wanted to uh, – forego football and go into wrestling my parents didn't want me to do wrestling at all so were you good I, in football though yeah oh yeah i was all state i was an all-state kicker uh my sophomore junior and senior year i uh, was uh also all state linebacker as well but nice. i had offers to play for sacred heart and uh university of new haven so yeah i i guess i wasn't too bad but i had a, a few injuries so I wanted to let my body rest and then maybe I would rethink it. But uh, wrestling kind of fell on my lap. I've been a fan my whole life and I've always told all my friends that it, that's all I wanted to do with my life. So an opportunity came to uh, go train with the RWA and I had to. So I I took the opportunity to do so. So, yeah. I mean, I'll say this: the rest though, is not, history. <laughs> not not much of a break for the body, though, from football. Probably more injuries in wrestling. <laughs> I don't know. I would just think, you know, football would. Well, wrestling. I think you know you hear about it. It's not a matter of when. It's a matter. Of, it's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. When you know something exactly. can happen. And in football, mm -hmm. you know, things happen, but they just happen kind of sporadically. In wrestling, you're kind of prepared. But again, even the best wrestlers have injured themselves. Best football players have hurt themselves. People get injuries. Sometimes, though, I feel like in wrestling, it gets spotlit a lot more because you, you notice it a lot more. When you go into, like, month-to-month -month shows and you start to follow guys and girls, you start to see their injuries because they're not there for, like, three to four weeks or three to four months or a year. Mm -hmm. So when they make a comeback, you're like, where have they been? Yeah. But um, 
but but yeah, you know, wrestling, you know, that's if you look at the olden days of, you know, pro wrestling, most of their people were grabbed from professional sports or football or, or minor league sports. You know, even like Macho Man played baseball, you know, for a mm-hmm. little bit before getting into WWE. Um, so did, did you find the transition rather easy, though, being already an athlete, being already used to kind of the physical training of, you know, conditioning your body? Not so much maybe the wrestling, the bumping and all that, but the conditioning, the training, the running, the, the cardio. You had that probably down pat, I guess. Yeah. I had that down pat. Um, the physical aspect of wrestling was, it came second nature to me. So it was a, it was a very easy transition for me. Nice, nice. Now you said you um you got an opportunity in RWA. Did you have friends that were wrestling out there already, or was it just something you saw in the town? Kind of, how did you get involved? So, I went to high school with somebody who was training with RWA at the time. Uh, he was also running his own backyard federation. So I started wrestling in his backyard, and uh, T Phoenix, and. Uh, I think Christopher Sterling showed up to a show, uh, one of the backyard shows, and they had approached me and were like, hey, you should definitely definitely come train. Come train with us. Uh, it'd, it'd really benefit you. So I kind of was like, you know what? This backyard stuff, I'm going to toss it to the side, and I'm actually going to go train in a ring. And Yeah, and you know, and like, and I don't, I don't like to knock backyard because I feel like a lot of people have gotten a valid start there. Some even promotions have gotten a valid start there. It's just a matter of what you do with it. If you stay in the backyard mm-hmm. and you keep it that backyard mentality, you're not going to go far. But if you like, you know, got as much as you could out of the backyard. Let's say there was a guy there that trained with the guy and he only knew, you know, ten percent, and you learned all that ten percent. You know, obviously you caught the eye of a promoter sitting there. You caught the eye of somebody else. They're like, you know, there's some potential. He could benefit from real training. Let's bring him. And in that case, you used, you know, that backyard scene to elevate your career um, and use exactly. it as a jumping point, which I see as a big difference is kind of this hanging around the backyard going, I'm a pro wrestler until somebody recognizes you. And then you're like, well, I don't really know what to do rather than, you know, do it the way, you know, they saw you're in the backyard. They saw you learned all you could do. And then they brought you up and, and they trained you and they brought you into a ring and, and you know. The rest kind of speaks for itself. I said the other night you're on IWTV live. That's not a backyard show. That's far from it. Um, you know, there was an RWA show the other night. I don't know if you were on that card. But they yes, were running. So. I was um I was actually talking to the monarchy during the beginning of that show. They've been very um they've been actually um doing a lot of victory and carrying a lot of gold around New England, mm-hmm. um, making a name for themselves. And that's what I like seeing, you know, people making a name for themselves. People that may have started somewhere small, but have gotten to a next level or making a name or getting better. Even that little arc of, you know, starting here and seeing the evolve up to here of how, you know, better people get. And I'm sure you could even agree when you started, you know, in 2011, 2012, you're a much different wrestler than you are right now today. (laughs) Vastly different. Vastly different. I'm uh I'm I i do not move as fast as I used to, but I can still go. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I mean, obviously, age plays a plays a role in wrestling. Um, as far as I wouldn't say what you can do because you can always push yourself, but mm-hmm. what, almost you're like between what your conscious decides you should do and what your body warns you not to do it, you kind of find a middle ground of how far to go because the injuries do do take longer to kind of heal i feel mm-hmm. things do get broken easier you know the top rope gets a little scarier <laughs> things are a little <laughs> bit different um granted i'm not a pro wrestler but i've done training camps and fancy days and, and just me going up on the top rope is scary because i had no balance coordination whatsoever and you know you watch the tv even you look at my toys, you know, the wrestling rings I had as a kid is, you know, the figures. Forever, the turnbuckle, the, the top, it was hard. So I figured that, well, it must have a hard platform, right? I can stand up. No. It's two ropes, and you're trying to balance. And, and then you're trying to figure out what you're going to do up there. And if you think too long, you're going to fall. So it was like, mm-hmm. up. And somebody held my hand. I was like, hold my hand. I went up and then jumped onto the crash pad. And I was like, damn, they make it look so easy. Yeah, it's a, 
It's a challenge. I I don't go there as much as I used to, but I, I've been known to uh, do a few things off of there. I've been working on some stuff in, uh, at training recently, too, so keep your eyes out. You might see something wild from me soon. <laughs> and, and that's the other thing. The training never really ends. So even though, you know, you stopped training, you're still training today. Um, mm -hmm. What do you train today at? I uh, train at the Gladiator Training Academy in New Bedford. Okay. Uh, I actually run classes on Wednesday nights. Uh, BMT and I are actually the, the trainers there. Awesome. Yeah, so he does Monday nights and I do Wednesday nights there. That's yeah. great, you know. Um, and it's great seeing people that are on the scene, being used in the scene, teaching others how to do the same kind of follow footsteps, um, you know. It's not always in wrestling. I feel about, you know, like the big cash fall, the big cash day. It's just about, you know, doing it every week or doing something successful that kind of runs its course and, and that you can be happy doing and having fun doing it. It's not about this like kind of one time deal where you're going to go out and make a million bucks and then you'll be set for life. It's not really how it works, you know? But yeah, seeing people that, you know, do the grind and go to the, you know, the, the run the weekend, they're doing two, three shows and then having them teach, it's like, you know, that, that's practicing what you preach. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, I try to tell the students like, Hey, uh, if you're into this to make a lot of money, uh, you either gotta be super, uh, super successful athlete or you gotta have an in somewhere. So if you're in for it for the money, then get out now <laughs> because, it's this is about this business from my perspective has been about the grind and really pushing yourself to like go past your comfort zone and your and to expand your boundaries a little bit so you can gain exposure, get your name out there and really uh put yourself in a position to be seen by bigger companies and I feel like especially BMT recently, he's all over the place. So yeah. for our students to take him as an example is like, is a great thing for them. So I want them to see that and be like, I can do that. He, he lives five minutes down the road from the school. Like he, he works full time. He's a father, like he, and he's doing the thing, you know what I mean? So he, He's doing fantastic for himself, and I couldn't be happier because, honestly, recently he's probably one of my closest friends in the business, and he is – I can't. I wish that dude nothing but success, and he, nobody deserves it more than him right now. It's it's awesome to see. Yeah, definitely. You know, like I said, I was talking to him the other day, and just I watched this match at Chaotic, him and his you know, wife winning the titles, and just seeing how far they've come and seeing what they've gone through since the beginning of their journey. It's just – it's amazing to see, and they are all over the place. They are taking, you know, New England by storm, and, and it's good to see that again. You know, these are the people that are, are kind of, you know, paving the future of what wrestling is going to look like. Whether it's them directly or their students, they're going to be on TV. And we're at that next level. I mean, you're already seeing people that have gone and come back, like AG and stuff. They've, you know, and and they and they haven't come back any more different. You know, if anything, there's more of a grind. The other, you know, I saw AG a couple of weeks ago working three shows in one day. You know, he's been to WWE and back. He's been to AEW. He's been in nowhere in Japan, but he's still coming back and working three shows in New England area, you know, riding from Worcester to, to Maine to put in that grind. And, and you know, that's got to, like I said, that, A, there's got to be some kind of fun to that or some kind of addiction. I, even as a fan, I have to say in like 21, I was, you know, so stuck after the pandemic. I wanted to see so much wrestling. So I just went and saw everything I couldn't see. Um, starting with, you know, going up to Maine, I wanted to see Limitless. Then I went to Proving Ground. I hadn't got to see them. I wanted to see, you know. Then I ended up all the way out in Jersey, H2O Center, New York, for XPW. Like, I just went everywhere. Every weekend was a road trip. And I, I have to say, it, 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 I didn't have... It was one of the funnest times because you just pack and go. You didn't know what was going to happen. And I, and I always figured it was the same for the wrestlers because I would, you know, be at one show Friday night and see those same guys, you know, six hours in a different place the next day. And they'd be like, are you following me? I'm like, are you following me? <laughs> and, and it's like I'm doing the same trip as them, you know, just on a different level. And it's like it's pretty cool. I could see why somebody would enjoy that. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I have done it quite a bit where, uh, like earlier in my career, I did a lot. I did a lot. Like there were some, some days where I do a couple of shows where I'd go from, say I was doing limitless in Maine and then I'd have RWA on that next day. And then maybe the same day I would shoot over to one socket and do like NWWE and then, who knows sometimes beyond would be on that sunday so i was all, i was all over the place so it was uh it was fun and it, it was it was a cool thing to do and people people like yourself i would i would see traveling down the the coast and making the same shows as me so it was cool to see as well so that that's one thing i have to say about indie wrestling i don't know if it's everywhere but New England indie wrestling, they we have a very dedicated fan base. So I will see the same fans in Maine that I can see in Rhode Island, that I can see, you know, wherever I go. If there's a good show and, and some of just, you know, even one or two of the same characters are on that show, they'll follow out, they'll go out, and they'll check it out. And that, and that's, that says something because they, they're traveling. There's travel time involved. Um, and it doesn't have to be a big show. It could be one of the smallest shows, but you'll see the same fans show up there. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's cool even being, you know, another fan because you, you get to know those people too and talk to them, um, you know, and say, Hey, how you doing? You know, haven't seen you since the last show. And you talk about, you know, what shows are coming up and where they're going to be. And, you know, you start to make friendships. And, and that's how I feel indie scene is any which way when you walk into a hall, it doesn't matter if RWA, it doesn't matter if Limitless, NCW, wherever you go, it feels like a family, you know, everybody there together is on the same page, same level. You know, and it, it, you just you can say hi to anybody, and they're gonna say hi back. They don't really like. It's not like X or something where everybody has this crazy opinion. And they want to fight you. It's like it, that's the bad guy. Cool, you like him, okay, but you really should boo for him anyways. It's like nobody really fights you on stuff, and I think that's what also gravitated me. Me being older, like I got back into wrestling. You know, I I stopped watching wrestling for years and years, and I got back in around eighteen. 2017-18, Bray Wyatt kind of dragged me into this darkness characters. Mm-hmm. I'm big into horror. Horror is my favorite thing. So when I can never can see it combined, I, I gravitate towards it. So I got into it, but I found a lot of negativity with the mainstream. And so I got also into, um, at the same point, I was doing film and doing something. And I wanted to do a comedy skit. We wanted to involve wrestling somehow. So I did some research. And I walked into a little hall in Dedham. And I saw NCW for the first time. And I saw all these guys like Mike Montero, Dick Lane, and Anthony Green was there. And all these just characters that I just wasn't expecting to see at an indie show. Because the last indie show I went to, it was just a bunch of kind of local guys that nobody knew. And then they brought in like Honky Tonk Man. It was like, er, it was early 90s. Okay, we had Polaroids. They were taking Polaroids and you could go home with the Polaroid picture for five bucks. It, 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 was, a, it was a long time ago, but... You know, I didn't go to a lot of wrestling after that. There wasn't too much promotion for it. Into that, I was like, wow, this is, you know, everybody has a character and a cool character at that. And, you know, and, and that was going to bring it back to what I was going to say earlier. Like, I feel like, you know, the school there, um, the Gladiator School, where it opened, is like almost a godsend because for a while, schools are either like way up north or way out west. There's nothing really like in that area as far as a good school to kind of train well you do have a uh, top rope there the lockup academy which is in fall river so it's not not too far from us so no, but they have a different vibe it's not that and and again it's nothing against top rope but again it's it's there they might be more money i've told and, and i've also heard students say that you know they've been turned away they sometimes play with politics different things but like I said, I've heard a lot of people say when Gladi is open, they were happy to find training in that area because it wasn't going into another town. It was right in their hometown. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's uh, kind of a nice uh, mid-ground from like Fall River and Rhode Island's not too far. It's like 40 minutes, I think. Yeah, because I'm originally from Rhode Island. So yeah, it's like a 40, 45 minute drive. It's not too bad. And then you have, uh, for, like say you're coming from the Cape, you live in the Cape. It's like a, a very good mid ground, so it's not not bad. No, and, and again, like I said, it all. De- I mean, I guess it depends where you want to kind of work to. After, if you go to one school, you're gonna you be pushing one direction. 
if you do go to Top Rope, there's nothing wrong with that, but you're kind of going to be used for those shows as well. And, and that's with any promotion that's kind of attached to a school, you kind of get pushed towards that promotion, which which is nice in a way. It's like having, you know, to go to college and then almost handed a job afterwards if you graduate. Yeah. You don't have to go searching. Um, yeah. But, you know, again, it can kind of feel awkward, especially if you want to work for other promotions that are outside of that. It's like, eh, when do I kind of break out of this or break out of that? And that's the thing. There's no contracts in New England. People can work wherever they want. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, but, um, you know, like I said, you've been doing this for a while. You, you're still doing it. Um What's the secret to that longevity? Like, you don't burn yourself out? Uh, honestly, I I ended up taking a few years off because I had to uh, get my head on straight. I was actually burning out, so I had to uh, fix fix here before I could continue. It, I, I took about eh, like two and a half years, almost three years off from like 2018 to 2021 and and that that's probably probably saved my ass so i uh i i've been able to work re- pretty much religiously every weekend since so and you know i, mean, I, I it's something i hear sometimes you know that the mental game in pro wrestling that the mental taxation sometimes is something that we don't see mm-hmm. but it, it's very it's very taxing. It, it can take its toll and take its toll very easily. And like you said, you can burn your stuff out, especially when you're doing stuff physically and you don't take the time to kind of rest your body. Your mind can just go off. And then if you can't do that, you're not going to be good performing in the ring or anywhere else. Um, but, you know, in, in your defense, you kind of you, you picked a kind of good time. Some of that was, you know, COVID time, which you would have been sitting home anyways. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know. And you got to kind of come back when COVID came, you know, the wrestling came back from COVID, which was, you know, a terrible time. Um, you know, I, like I said, I got into indie scene around 18, 17, 18. I started checking out shows. By 19, I was pretty much into it. Um, I was at like NCW religiously. I was just getting into it beyond shows. Again, I didn't really travel much north. It was on my radar. I wanted to go to Proving Ground. I wanted to go to Limitless. 2020 came around. I started right back up. You know, I went to these couple shows. There was a Beyond show, BC Dub. Then there was um, NCW's season opener. Then there was another small show, I believe, in Watertown, OCW. Um, but, you know, I had tickets to go to Limitless, which was supposed to be AG versus Statlander. And I was watching carefully this, um, you know, proving ground to me at this time caught my eye. Because um, the graphics for me were very video game based. They were doing, you know, proving out one, two, three, four, five. And me being a video game, you know, fan, I um, I was just, you know, consumed by this. I was like, this is so cool. They're combining these things. So I, I wanted to get into it. Plus, I saw they were bringing in a steel cage. So I had all these plans to go to all these shows. And, you know, COVID hit. Done. So it was all on, like, lockdown. I'm just like, I'm watching everybody online. I'm seeing people now. You know, this was during... Like almost right before Mania weekend, I'm seeing people, um, you know, having to cancel their plans, and I'm just feeling bad for them because I know what it, you know. I know what that means. I know what the extra work in Mania means for people, money wise, and the merch sales and every weekend merch sales can add up. It might mm-hmm. not be like the millions we talked about, but it's enough to grind by, and it's enough to supplement the job. Yeah, um, you know, you don't have to do that in Grubhub. You could do that in Wrestle. It, mm-hmm. it, it, it kind of fits. Um, so I started to, you know, buy people's merch and people, you know, pick things at random. So I knew that it was kind of missing. And it was also the time I started the podcast. I wanted to start putting eyes and ears on people. I said, well, this is no better than the time. People are home. They can talk. Let me see what I can do. Um, and then we got something kind of cool. We got um, taped wrestling, which was kind of nice. It was wrestling at a pace that you could talk about, I would say. It gave yeah. me a good platform. I could watch, you know, a show on Thursday night or whatever, Wednesday night. There were shows like almost every night that were being taped. And, you know, I could talk about it the following week. And then, you know, shows started having pay-per-views. We could build that up. And we had some of a platform to talk about these indie shows while everybody wasn't so busy doing life. Everybody was still kind of at home chilling. 
But um, but I guess so at that point though, I mean, you like at that point you were saying you were still at break, but mm-hmm. it must have been kind of in a relief too because like I said you weren't really missing much. Yeah, I, w- I wasn't really missing too much at that time. I was uh, because I think it was like 2019. I had thought about maybe uh reaching back out to a few promotions to see if I could get a foot back in. Uh, kind of had second thoughts and didn't. So I guess the as as horrible COVID was and what it did to the world and as a whole, it it was kind of a blessing in disguise for me. So I, I, mean, I have to I have to say it's a fifty fifty. Yes, it was a lot of bad stuff, um, and unfortunately, a lot of people lost lives and a lot of sickness, but. I also met a lot of amazing people during that time within wrestling. I met a lot of amazing promoters, wrestlers, other personalities. I made a lot of great connections. And I was able to just kind of figure out what I wanted to do as far as podcasting. Because prior to that, I was kind of all over the place. I was um, you know, covering this, you know, WWE, AEW, all this stuff. And I was just having no success hitting certain demos. And I realized, you know, I'm a really, especially in WWE, I'm a really small, small fish in a really big pond. There's wrestlers with podcasts that, you know, are getting on other wrestlers that are well-known. It's like, I can't compete with them. And there's a lot of people talking about a lot of things. And then, you know, AEW was kicking off, so that was okay. But again, it was kind of out of my reach. I can't go to every AEW show. I can't commit to that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But the indie scene was very tangible. It was very hands-on i could reach this i could go to every show if i wanted to you know for one promotion anyways i could go every show for the whole year i don't have to miss it these shows are you know 20 or 30 minutes away anywhere between 10 and 30 dollars a ticket that's very easily manageable mm-hmm. um that's what kind of really also got me into it how immersive the indie scene is you know i've seen you you know come out and the fans will just adore you little kids yeah. NCW kids, they adore you. They'll be screaming your name. They, you know, that that takes talent. You're you're winning people over. You're getting fans. Um, you can't you can't interact the same way on TV with fans as you can at you know a show in Dedham. Yeah, that's true. I I uh, I personally love the intimacy of independent wrestling and like you're. I can't do a uh, very good measurement. Say this is a ring and the first row at an independent show. This this is the ring and the first row at like a wrestling show or the, you have the, the cheap seats. You know what I mean? It's very hard to resonate this with the top row. You know what I mean? So it's – I like independent wrestling personally a lot more. I mean uh... – I'll... Obviously, I'm still a fan, but at the same time, like independent re- independent wrestling is where it's at. That's kind of how I am. I mean, as a kid, obviously, like I said, I grew up. You know, I would turn on the TV, see the Macho Man, and, and all these larger than life characters, Andre the Giant. They had me. You know, they had me from the get go. I wanted to be some sort of something to do with pro wrestling. I was a little short, a little small for training at the time, so it didn't work out that way. But I never really, like I said, I I always wanted something to do with it. And then, you know, I kind of fell out of it. You know, life happens. You get busy. Mm -hmm. Um, Other things kind of took precedence, family matters. um, And, you know, coming back to it, almost a lot of that nostalgia from the olden wrestling kind of just flew back in even before modern wrestling kind of grabbed hold of me. So I'll watch modern wrestling. Like I said, I'll put on the TV if something's on, if I'm, you know, have, nothing to do, but I don't prioritize it, I guess, the same as I do an indie show. I don't dedicate, you know, a whole Saturday or Sunday to going to a show, the same as watching a TV show. I don't, you know, I don't, I'll try to watch every, you know, wrestling open. I can't say I watch every Raw. Like, it's different things, but that's because I'm really invested in the scene. I'm invested in the people like yourself and seeing, you know, where you're going to be, how you're going to be wrestling, who you're going to be wrestling, the great matchups that take place. Like we just said, you know, there was, you know, you just had a great four-way match, you know, on um, Blitzkrieg. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, that was a hell of a show, too. I don't know how it, how was the, um, I want to ask, how was the vibe there? Because the vibe at home 
it looked like it was wild because you had the wrestling going on, then you had these like wild live bands going on, then you had more wrestling. Like it looked like a music festival with with pit fights. Oh yeah, it was uh, it it was awesome. Honestly, that's <laughs> that's all I could ever really ask for was uh, good music, live wrestling. Uh, the venue was super cool too. Everybody there was super nice and and welcoming. So it was it was one of those environments that was intense but also chill at the same time if that makes sense yeah it was, no, definitely um it i can see it the awesome. brewery it looked cool the only thing that was a little weird was during cruel cruel you know a very menacing character dark demonic kind of evil character and then they had this really brightly like flowery kind of brewery background <laughs> and it's like this is really surreal now mind you i'm a couple of blunts in too and i'm watching like this is surreal, man. This guy's fighting in the background, right? He's killing Effie. This is great, <laughs> though. This, this is pro wrestling. Um, and, and and again, Blitzkrieg is one of those shows that I kind of watch a lot of because it's something that's a little bit different. They do things a little bit different. Um, it's a little bit far for me to always get to the show because like it's like three and a half hours, I think it said on my my clock, so I couldn't get there, but. You know, I run another show um, called The Nor'easter, and I have another podcaster um, named Vic, and we, you know, we actually decided to sponsor that show. So we actually ended up with your match. Um, oh, the Nor'easter cool. sponsored that match that night, but um, we didn't even know that when we were booking the interviews. That, you know, Phil didn't tell us until like after, and we saw it later that when Phil came on, he's like, "You're gonna have this match." I'm like, "Oh, sweet! I know like half of those people." Um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, you know, we we still, you know, we decided that. You know, I I been doing VSW for a while, and he was doing his show for a while. But both of us, at some point, we you know we got local guys, and then we started getting kind of like a different demo too. He got an overseas demo in like Finland and stuff, and I started getting demos out in Texas and Kansas, and other people you know wanted to come on wrestling wise. So we said, you know, why don't we do something? You know, when we were at that luau. He invited me to that luau show. And I went out with him, and we I spent the night out there in Connecticut um, at a hotel. And first time I go into Blitzkrieg. Now, again, I, I actually bought tickets to their um, their show before. It was um, Feed the Meat. I remember because it was um, MV Young versus AG, and I really wanted to see AG versus MV Young. But I it was like a Friday night, and I bought the tickets not even realizing it's a Friday night show. And a three-and-a-half-hour drive on a Friday night is almost near impossible for me. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm not a traffic person, so I'm like, I can't do it. No. Um, I'd have to leave, like, Friday morning and spend the day and the night. Like, I can't, I can't do traffic to show and then drive home. I can't. Um, but I always, it was always one of those shows I wanted to go to. So I went there, and we were like, we were just talking. Like, we should just do something, you know, just specifically about New England wrestlers and, you know, try to spotlight them even more. I know we do, but let's talk about them even more. And again, those, that's one of the promotions we kind of, you know, spotlight is Blitzkrieg because we feel like there's a lot of great wrestlers out there, um, especially coming from like the cap area and, and out that way. And again, you know, um, and then me, I have a lot of, you know, again, expertise in people from like you know, NCW, Proving Ground, RWA. Um, they're one of the shows that I've been meaning to actually get to for many years. Um, I don't get out to Rhode Island. You would think I would. It, it just always seems like something. Every time there's a Rhode Island show, it could be RWA, it could be that New World Extreme show, it could be anything. I, I'll have tickets in hand. I could buy them up front. Something will happen in my life where I'm like, oh, I can't go. Like My car won't start. My wife will, will come home and say no. Like Something will happen. Yeah. But eventually I will because I heard that um, a lot of the wrestlers that I love do some of their best work in RWA. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, it's like R their home. It's their home, so they, they treat it as their home. And you might be one of them. I know Mike Montero is another one. He's another one that mentions it. And yeah. and they treat it such. So it, they, they fight extra hard over there. And I heard they just put on a tremendous um, showcasing. Yeah, yeah. Um, we just had a show this past Saturday in Providence. Um, it was... It's. I think we we packed close to three hundred people in the venue. Uh, that we've been having crazy crazy draws recently. Like we had our 
our like big biggest show of the year legacy was in on august 10th we uh we drew i think a little over or close to 600 people uh with bmt and i in the main event in a steel cage it was it was awesome like it, rwa has been on a, on a roll recently and... and and they're another one they've really they have an arc too they started at a certain level and really have gotten themselves up to that next tier and maybe a few more tiers beyond that like they're really up there in what pro wrestling is a standard of um you know and really have really i think elevated the scene of rhode island for wrestling too yeah it's uh uh, for for a while, Rhode Island was mainly Beyond territory. Uh, you had Beyond doing a lot of shows there, and RWA was kind of like I wouldn't say second tier because I, that's that's where I started, and I viewed it as something that was uh, very prominent. But at the same time, they were there's there's levels. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I mean, so, I, I put it this way, and I always say this, I mean, everybody's great, but I think, like, Beyond and Limitless are, like, they're at that tier right below that million-dollar budget being the next level. And then you've yeah. got all these other great promotions, and they are great. It's just they don't get that major spotlight because they're not bringing in the Orange Cassidys. They're not bringing in, you know, the Dan Hosens. They're not bringing in all these TV wrestlers that used to be or are coming back. So they just kind of they lose the prominence. But the wrestling pound for pound is still some of the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll put an RWA show up against any of those shows. I mean, just like you said, pound for pound, the, the quality of wrestling that you'll get is the same, if not better. Uh, we're, we're drawing the same numbers, if not more, than some of those shows, too. So it's, uh, I guess it's all perspective. <laughs> so... What I gotta do yeah. is I gotta be smart and just be like and, and tell my wife, you know what? I think we're gonna go to you know Federal Hill for the weekend, get some nice dinner. We're gonna spend a hotel, be alone, and I'll make sure there's an RWA show that weekend that we can go to. <laughs> and this way, yeah. I can just say, you know what? Guess what, honey? We're going to wrestling too. Yeah. And that's uh, the thing. My wife likes wrestling. She really does. She likes good wrestling. She likes NCW. She goes to Proving Ground. She loves that stuff. Um. You know, I, I'm sure she would love RWA. She loves a lot of those guys. She was mad that she couldn't be here tonight for this interview. She does her own little thing now where she comes on and asks five questions. She um, had to wake up super early tomorrow for work, so she had to miss this one. But, you know, she's been getting into it, too. My kid's at the age, you know, he just turned six. He's getting into pro wrestling now pretty big. Um, and he's starting to be able to go to shows and sit in them and actually watch and, and be like, oh, I like this guy. I like that guy, you know. Of course, I'm still getting most of the brunt of it. I'm getting, you know, this, this, the, I call him like the most stiffest elbow in the world. He just like hops from wherever and just lands his little elbow right in my chest. Yeah, I know that one. <laughs> and it's like, he, it, it's not a work. He's not trying to, but to him, it, it, you know, he's wrestling. It's just like, ugh. But no, um, I love seeing that because again, as a kid, that's where it was. I mean, I had wrestling buddies. I had toys. I had all this magazine. Wrestling consumed me. Um, mm -hmm. So to pass that on, I feel like it's almost an honor and an enjoyment to be able to watch that with my mom. Um, I feel like wrestling is a family you know, kind of sport. You know, It is something that kind of ties generations together. When I was growing up, my grandparents, they came from Italy. When they first came here, there wasn't a lot to do. They were going to Boston Garden every weekend and watching wrestling different shows that they were having and different house shows and this and that. And, and, and even them, you know, two immigrants from Italy barely could speak English. They would watch some WWE. Mm -hmm. So it's like wrestling is almost like universal language in some extent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my, my, uh, I actually have a similar story with that. Like my, uh, my grandparents all came from Portugal. So they, the same thing. My well, at least my dad's side, they were more wrestling fans than my mom's. But they would sit down. We would all gather around the TV. We'd all chip in and order a pay per view, and we'd all watch. Um, my dad's actually a referee, so he he uh, he's involved in the business as well. Uh, he's been doing it for a very long time, just about as long as I've been wrestling. So we're all. I mean, my whole family's really 
really involved with it too. So it's, it's really cool. And now I can, uh, bring my, my stepson around. He's, he's doing his thing as well. He's, he's coming to the shows and having a good time with everybody there. And everybody's been really welcoming of him as well and supportive. And it's, it's really cool to see. And it's, it warms my heart, you know? That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, just to get a few more questions for you. Um, what would you say would be like your, your most, like if you had to like pick like one or oh, even a few of like your highlighting or, or like match career matches, like favorite career match, what would you say they were? Like my favorite matches that I've had? The, yeah, you've been in. Okay. Uh, how many do you want me to say? One or two or three? You say like two. I, I sometimes, if you have three, say three. I don't like to say one because I know there's always going to be more than one. Yeah. Yeah. So I have, I actually have three. Um, I would say the third one was the match that I had with Paul London in 2017. Uh, I wrestled him for XWA. Um, number two, I would say I had a really, really good match with Mike Montero at Fight Life. We had a, a no DQ match and it was... Probably some of the most fun that I've had in a ring. Oh, hello. Yes, this is Luca. He's here. Nice to meet you, buddy. <laughs> a little shy. A little shy. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> um, oh, Mike Montero is one of the best. You know what? I, I have to say, I mean, when I first came in and saw wrestling and I saw him come out, and at that time they were called Detox. It was on Jason Devine and Ricky Medeiros. He reminded me so much of like an Adam Cole kind of figure coming out there. Like he just had this aura about him. Yeah, he's a. Uh, I've I've known him for a very very long time. He was around when I first started, so I've had many a many a matches with him, and I can't really say that we've had a bad one. So, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Was there any other matches in there you kind of can think of? Um... Yeah, I had I had two. I was I was gonna give one more. Uh, I I uh, wrestled uh, JT Dunn in twenty seventeen. It's probably my favorite match uh, that I've ever had. Was at a random XWA throwdown on a Thursday night in front of like maybe twenty five people. <laughs> it was uh, it was awesome, and I I don't think we had any hiccups. We did some really cool things, and I had a lot of fun. I, him and I have, uh, we have really good chemistry. So whenever we mix things up, it was, it was really good. Nice. Have you worked, have you like crossed paths with him prior or worked with him before? Um, he's actually my main trainer. Thanks for coming on, Luca. Thank you. Oh, is he? Yeah. Yeah. He actually, uh, played a very big hand in training me. Yeah. That's awesome. You know, he's a household name. I said, I've, I've seen him a lot in chaotic wrestling, obviously, and I've seen him in limitless. Um, he's been still doing work in Limitless. You know, he comes out, puts on, he's performed, you know, great match. He had one um, recently with Desmond Cole. It was really good. Um, good storyline and good wrestling, like both. And what he does and has been doing across New England for the years, you know, even with the unit, I find it very entertaining. One of the most dominating um, factions out there. Um, but I, I didn't even realize he was on, he helps train and stuff. That's awesome. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a while back, but yeah, he uh, he ran classes for RWA for a while. Oh, nice, nice. Um, no, he's like I said, like another one in this area that's kind of underrated. We got a lot of, I feel like, a lot of talent in this area that you kind of look at them and you're like, why aren't they on TV? <laughs> because it's like they're really good, like they're excellent, they're level, their TV level quality is just for some reason they're not. Like, I look at someone like JG Dunn. He should be on, you know, Raw almost every week. I look at someone like Ava Everett. She should be on Raw almost every week. I look at these people like that because I've seen what they've done on this scene. It's like I've seen people what they're doing on Raw, and they're they're, they're better. They're doing it better. Um, and they have even maybe even more passion doing it. Um, yeah. But, yeah. I mean, again, I'm impartial to all the indie scene. Everybody in, I think they're better than anybody on TV. I'm just impartial about that, but that's just the way I am. Um, I mean, that's the part of wrestling that I like. Like I tell people wrestling is very inclusive and very, you know, subjective. You can take whatever you want. You can like different things. You might like deathmatch wrestling, right? 
You might like comedy core. You might like the horror stuff. You might like this. I like the independent scene, whatever it entails. Um, Because I feel like it has a good breed mix of everything from, you know, horror, horror core wrestling all the way to, you know, strong style. It's got a little bit of everything. I mean, look at you. You're a, you're a horror character. You play a dark character. You're the mind. Yes. Have, is that something you always were? Is that something you came in being? No. No. Uh, when I started, I was actually under the name of Mr. Awesome. I was uh, just like a, a prick, basically. Uh, <laughs> I didn't really do anything too special, but I uh, saw myself as better than everybody else. <laughs> and then... So an early, an early MJF. Uh... Yeah, yeah, le- less rich. Like, I wouldn't say that I, I I played up the fact that I am better than everybody else because I have more money. You did uh, better. Just, yeah, just better athletics-wise. And, yeah, that's that was basically it. I Everything that I did was awesome. So that's where that came that's from. Mm-hmm. But um, you obviously must, like, enjoy horror. So much. So yeah, much. I can just tell by everything. Um, I have Leatherface on my arm. <laughs> That's what I love. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I have great movie. Ed Gein on my shirt, who is who uh, inspired Texas Chainsaw Massacre, yeah. and <laughs> yeah. Oh, you should see. You should hold on. You should see this thing. I'll pull it out. I'll pull it out for you. Hold on. I picked this up last year. <laughs> this That's thing awesome. is wonderful. It looks like it. Now, oh, it fell. But I'll say this: it was like it wasn't like you know one of the cheapest masks. But I, I saw this and I was like, oh my god, I have to have it because it's like it's a really nice replica. Yeah, they did really was... nice leather work, and they really did nice with like the detail work, and then the hair was really real. And I was like, okay, this is quality. And I got this in like, I don't know, the um apron. I'm a sucker during Halloween time. Like, I play this game. My wife's like, okay, you're gonna dress up this year. And I'm like, yeah, I dress up every year. You know, I go trick or treating with the kids. But I, I do sound sneaky. Like, I'll start off really early, like in September. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna be Leatherface. And I buy the costume, I buy everything it needs. And then, like, in two weeks, I'll be like, you know what? I think I'm going to be Terrifier. And I buy a whole new costume. And by the end of Halloween, like, before Halloween, I have every year, like, about another new seven costumes complete. <laughs> like, I have a closet full of horror costumes. Everything from, like, Slenderman, you know, uniforms to, like, Leatherface, Michael Myers, Jason, Freddy Krueger, Terrifier, Pennywise, like, Every horror character, I just have costumes for, and I'm, you know, and I got a green screen. So sometimes I'll make like fun little green screen films with it and stuff. But um, it's just one of those things. I've always been a horror fan, probably as long as I've been a wrestling fan. You know, I would go to the video stores as a kid, and the wrestling section was here, and right around the corner was the horror section. I was just like picking one and one. I got WrestleMania yeah. four, and I've got you know Night of the Living Dead. Okay, I'm going home now, and, and it's just how it was. Um. I tried to have always incorporated that into um, just daily kind of things. I'm a big horror fan. There's no way of going about it. My wife hates it because I only want to watch horror movies. And, like, at nighttime, for me, like, you know, she'll want to watch something, like, relaxing. And to me, relaxing is a horror movie that I've already seen that I already know what's going to happen because then it's not stressful. So I don't care if they all get killed or they don't because I know that I know how it's going to end. So I'll just put it on as relaxing. She's like, what are you watching? That screen, what, what's all this? I'm like, no, this is a good movie. I've seen it. Like, not at night. It's, it, you know, or I'll put on something I haven't seen. I'll fall asleep. And then, like, somewhere in the middle of the night, there'll be some kind of a scene where somebody gets murdered. And they'll just hear this pitch scream throughout the house because my volume's gone up. And, like, everybody just wakes up out of bed like, what the hell's going on? And, like, we realized the TV was left on. The movies were just kept rolling. Um, I'm no like famous for doing that, but, but I love seeing it. Like I said, and I love seeing things like, you know, like that you bring into the ring. Um, recently I, a couple of, well, last year I saw some kill city cup. They had some horror into it. There's a few other horror characters on the scene and, and when they're done, right. They're beautiful. When they're done wrong, it, 
it's a joke, but again, when they're done right, it's beautiful. Um, you know, your character, it's always brings something like, I don't know how to, I don't know how to describe it. It's like, it's Joker almost, but like a madman, but like a, 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 a terror, like a terror character, but, but it's a lovable horror character because there is kids that love it, but again, it's kind of a madman, kind of unstable. It's very unique. It's not your typical kind of a horror character. Yeah. Um, yeah. How'd you come up with that idea? So I went from being Mr. Awesome to this like white meat baby face character that really wasn't me. I was just kind of fitting what I had to be at the time. And I got, I've had a few concussions and I had to take a couple months off because I had a really bad one. And I think this was in 20, 2013. I had a pretty bad concussion. I had to take a couple months off. So I got to thinking and I was like, personally in my, my personal life, I was having like mental breakdown after mental breakdown because I didn't know what to do with myself. And then I kind of had an epiphany where I was like, I'm losing my mind right, like right now. I feel like my mind's being erased almost. And I got to thinking and I came up with this idea where what if I use this injury as like a catapult into something completely different than what I've been. And I kind of just went into this whole thing where I got committed. I escaped. Uh, I like getting screened for like head issues and injuries and stuff like that and mental health things. And I escaped the the hospital multiple times or I got day passes to go fight. Um, I basically had my mind erased and wanted people to feel the pain that I felt. So I came up with the whole mind eraser thing. It's almost and... like a living gimmick in a way. Well, well, yeah, like all all wrestling gimmicks should be extensions of yourself in a way. So I really took that to heart and extended myself. You know what I mean? Like I personally, I'm not a crazy guy. I'm, I'm, I'm like a quiet guy. I don't really talk too much. Um, even even me doing this is stepping out of my comfort zone, which is yeah, I was going to say, like, even at shows, not for none, but you're, you're, you're kind of relatively shy. Like yeah. intermission wise of you're pretty cool. You got your eight by tens and stuff, but you're not out there, you know, screaming to people, come on over, come and see me. Yeah. You know, you're just, you're just there vibing. There's nothing wrong with that, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I do appreciate you though, coming on and talking, but I can tell, you know, it might be out of the comfort zone. You know, not everybody is used to doing that or even talking or, or being the talkative type. Your character doesn't need to talk a lot, which is kind of yeah. nice. Yeah. Um, I, I tailored it because of that. <laughs> <laughs> But again, that's kind of an extension of yourself, and it, and it works. You know, not everybody's a social butterfly. So why would you want to make yourself force talk or force have to do be someone that you don't want to be? Um, mm -hmm. It makes things awkward in wrestling, especially when you're not having a, a million dollar contract thrown. At you. Someone's not throwing at you saying, "Hey, here's a million dollars. Go be sociable." That's a little different than, yeah. "Hey, I want <laughs> you to, you know, go out there and you know talk to everybody, but nothing's changing, you know, anywhere else." You know, it. There's a difference and you know, what people, you know, you'll hear people say that, you know, in WWE, you know, you're handed characters, but yes, with that character comes money. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. You know, and, and like in Hollywood, you get handed a role, you get handed a check with that role. You're going to play this character, but here's the money that goes along with it. In the indie mm -hmm. scene, it's kind of like you make a character, you make him valuable, and then you kind of put the price on its head. Here, this is who I am and this is what it's worth. Exactly. You know, and, and building that character, it's it's not an overnight thing. It can take months. It can take years. It can take a decade. It, it, it's an ever-evolving process. But yeah. it's very rewarding at the end. You have a, a solid character that you've created from scratch that you have a history with, a past with. It has, you know, all these involving storylines with. Um, it's deep character work. And, and, you know, in a literary sense, it's, you know, great backstories and stuff make a comic book out of a wrestler's life if you really yeah. wanted to. Um, yeah. <laughs> so let me ask you something. Where can people um, see you wrestle next? Where are people going to see you on the scene? Uh, so tomorrow, uh, 
what's tomorrow the 18th it's uh september 18th uh, yes. i'll be in Re rehoboth for fight life i'll be uh teaming with rip bison against the haven oh wow uh, uncle ripper he's yeah another one i love him he's wild he, he's like he brings he brings a style of wrestling that i haven't seen probably in like like he brings it back to like the Bruiser Brody days for me, really. Like he's just mm -hmm. a brute. Um, but yeah, Fight Life, come on! And I kept, I forgot about. That. I knew there was something. I kept seeing like a weird show on a Wednesday. I'm like, why is there a show on a Wednesday? What's going on here? And I remember, it's like I keep remember it's Fight Life. <laughs> yeah, they they usually run Wednesdays. Um, they run a lot of Sundays as well. Uh, I have that show, and then my next show after that is. The 28th, yeah, I have NRG in Fairhaven, Massachusetts. I'm the NRG champion right now. I'll be defending my title against uh, BRG. Ooh, that's so, a great matchup. Yeah, it'll be it'll be a good one. I'm excited. Now, who did you win to um, become the NRG champion? I beat Scott Levesque. I don't know if you know who that yeah, is. Yeah, I know Scott. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Uh, that, that's another promotion that's on my list of promotions. It's kind of hard to get there on those dates sometimes, and it's kind of a hike, but it, it's one of those promotions that I've seen a lot of guys come out of, again, out of you know the Gladiator School that are coming and really performing and putting in that next level work, and it's something a little different than all the others. And again, you're seeing these great storylines, great matchups. You know, um, Another valuable promotion in New England, again, you know, and that's why I think that we got in New England. That's why I say we're some of the best wrestling in New England because we have some of the best promoters, promotions, and trainers in the world operating in one area. That's true. Um, and, and, and that's just the facts. It's not, you know, me gloating. You know, you could just see who's getting picked in AEW, who's getting picked in WWE. Try to do the demo, see where people are coming from, coming from this area. They've been coming from this area for a very, very long time. Um, can't wait to see you in BRG, though. That's going to be a great match. He's another one. His success arc has been, you know, whoop. you know, he started at one spot and has really gotten himself to that next level by grinding and working and working and working. Mm -hmm. um, and it's great to see it. I can't wait. I got one more question. I got actually two more questions. Well, one's going to be is if, you know, anybody watching or anybody thinking about getting into pro wrestling as a wrestler, what would you recommend them to do and, you know, why? So if you're if you're really thinking about getting into wrestling, depending on where you where you live, um, I would just do your research. Um, really look into the schools uh, before you give them any money. I'd really really do your research. Um, I would recommend Nepwa, like off the rip. I'd say Nepwa's probably number one school and I, I would say probably the country right now is is an uh they have they're just cranking them cranking them out you know what i mean yeah it's uh it's it's really cool to see um Nepua, I'm, I'm, and i think right now you got die jack and ag is like head trainers over there which is you know an uh, amazing combo right now if you want to get to the next level because they've exactly. both been there and they've both been successful at the next level so mm -hmm. And then you have if you're if you're local and you uh if you're local to like the New Bedford area, I would I would definitely say come on down and uh talk to Davy Cash or uh Shay Cash about joining up with the Gladiator Trading uh Training Academy. Uh you can also shoot me a message or shoot uh BMT a message and inquire about that school. There's also the lock up in Fall River. There there's uh there's a bunch of really good schools in this area, so. But going to a school is probably number one key. For a step, finding yes. out one that's going to work for you, and then going with it, committing to it, and, and getting involved, and, and seeing mm -hmm. what it's going to do. Yes. Very good. Um, where can folks find you on social? So I am at Mindy Racer MG on everything. So nice. Twitter, Instagram. Yeah, it's. I like it. I I talked to some guys. They got like seven different names for seven different socials. I'm like, how am I supposed to even remember two of them? <laughs> like, come on. I like that. Keep it simple. Keep it all the same. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, good luck tomorrow night. Good luck defending your title. Thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it, honestly. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everybody at home, for watching. 
And as always, support indie wrestling. Versace's selling her out!